Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This is an interesting and an important editorial where the author talks about reasons behind alarming monsoon flooding in major cities in our country which we observe every year. The monsoon flooding has caused devastation this year as well in cities like Hyderabad and Mumbai. So the author provides suggestions and way forward to mitigate the monsoon flooding particularly in urban areas. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, when the torrential rains cause urban flooding or monsoon flooding every year, the immediate blame is put on three events. One is unpredictable nature. The second is uncontrolled greed for wealth that leads to destruction of wetlands. Thirdly, unrestricted urbanization. Let us discuss these and some other reasons by taking the example of Hyderabad. The first reason is unpredictable nature. Now this refers to unprecedented rainfall. Now it is true that in the recent years we are facing extraordinary rainfall. For example, Hyderabad is experiencing excess of rainfall in the months of September and October in recent years. In the year 2017, the city witnessed 450 percentage increase in average rainfall in the month of September. In 2019, the rainfall was the highest in 100 years in September. And if you take the current situation, that is in 2020, the rainfall received has been the highest for the month of October in a century. So this first reason, it manifests another reason, which is our inability to manage the drainage systems in the cities. In some places, antiquated or outdated infrastructure also exists, which have not been updated according to the current needs. For example, take Hyderabad, the city has century-old drainage system that was developed in the 1920s. Now, this drainage system covered only a small part of the core city. But the issue is, if you see the last 20 years, the city has grown beyond its original limits into the areas where there was no drainage infrastructure at all. So without addressing the issue of absence of adequate drainage systems, the city has grown rapidly. Next, if we take the second event on which the blame for flooding is put on, that is the uncontrolled greed for wealth. The greediness causes incremental change in land use, particularly the usage of common lands which provide us with necessary ecological support, for example, wetlands. This means in some places there are no wetlands left. This leads to rainwater or flood water not draining into them. In other places, the size of wetlands has shrunk to such a level that they could hold very less amount of flood water. The greediness, it also rejects the support to the local communities who are involved in managing local ecosystems including wetlands. The next reason is unrestricted urbanization. We can link this to the previous reason as well. Now the main issue here is that urbanization leads to urban terrain as that which is incapable of absorbing, holding and discharging water. Now this is because cities are becoming increasingly impervious to water. This is because of the usage of hard and non-porous construction material that makes the soil impervious. So based on these reasons, author provides some suggestions and way forward to tackle the issues. The first and foremost suggestion is the need for a mission that mitigates flood risk as well as providing a pathway to water security. Here is where the idea or the concept of spawn cities come into play. Now this concept was emerged and developed in China. The spawn city concept indicate a particular type of city that does not act like an impermeable system. When we say impermeable system, it means the system does not allow any water to filter through the ground. So it does not act like an impermeable system. And spawn city is a city that is more like a sponge that actually absorbs the rainwater, which is then naturally filtered by the soil and the absorbed water is allowed to reach into urban aquifers or urban wells. 
This in turn allows for extraction of water from the ground through urban wells or peri-urban wells that are recharged by this absorbed water. We have given a representational video for your better understanding. Please have a look. Now this water can easily be treated and can be used for city water supply. Therefore, rainfall and storm water could be transformed into water resources that could be utilized during the drought. So in this method, rather than using concrete to channel away rainwater, for example in some places we could see storm drains where concrete is used to channel away rainwater, we could work with nature to absorb, clean and use the water. Now the sponge city concept could be implemented through an urban mission like the smart cities mission. However, the mission should include these aspects. Now the next suggestion of the author is to focus on management of existing limited wetlands by involving local communities. Next is encouraging or mandating new porous materials and technologies for construction. Now this is to improve capacity of the city to absorb water. Example, we can say use of permeable material for roads and pavement, green roofs in buildings, etc. Therefore, the need of the hour is urgently rebuilding our cities in such a way that they have sponginess to absorb and release water without causing misery. So these are some of the important suggestions with reference to mitigating the pressure on urbanization, particularly mitigating flood risk. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article talks about the 100th anniversary of All India Trade Union Congress. In this context, let us understand about the history associated with All India Trade Union Congress along with the roles it performed in empowering the working class population of our country. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, AITUC, it is one of the largest trade union federations in our country. First, let's see about its history. See, the origins of labor movement in our country can be traced back to the second half of 19th century. It was the time when the British established their rule more firmly and the British brought changes to the traditional economy. They introduced cash crops to be exported and this contributed to the growth in the number of poor and landless peasants. The British also brought in cheap imports and this hurt Indian artisans as the demand for Indian products waned because of the introduction of cheap imports. The British also brought in money economy as a result the dominance of barter system was diminished. For the colonial aspirations, there were construction of railroads and also expansion of mining. Indians often protested and revolted in reaction to many of the conditions imposed by the British. We could see poor socio-economic conditions faced by laborers and also poor political representation. Mainly in the wake of the disturbance caused by First World War, the working people all over the world started seeing their situations in a more realistic manner. If you see, before 1920, there was no national federation to coordinate union activity in our country. Now, this lack of a national organization caused a problem because there were no representations in International Labour Organization of League of Nations from the side of India. See, League of Nations, as we know, was a precursor to the United Nations. So, to solve the issue of non-representation at the ILO, the government of India, during British rule, selected N.M. Joshi as a representative without consulting the unions. In response, many unions protested and Joshi in return proposed creation of an All India Trade Union Congress to solve the dispute. And this was not the only case for having such a body. There was also an increased need for having such a body for the rapidly expanding labor movements in our country at that point of time. Now let's come to the first meeting of this Congress. See the labor leaders in early July of 1920, they decided at a meeting that the Congress should meet in Bombay and that the representative to the ILO should be elected by the All India Trade Union Congress. 
So the workers, they created a reception committee of 500 members, which was headed by Joseph Baptista, who was the then president of Home Rule League. On 31st October 1920, the first session of All India Trade Union Congress was convened with Lala Lachibad Rai as the chairman. And today, 31st October 2020, is the occasion of AATUC completing its 100 years. Therefore, the relevance of its appearance in the newspaper. Now, in the first session on 31st October 1920, 101 delegates attended the meeting along with a number of political leaders. Now, this also included participation of a fraternal delegate from the British Trade Union Congress or a delegate from friendly British Trade Union Congress. Know that leaders such as Subhas Chandra, Jawaharlal, Mani Ben Kara, Vivigiri, S.A. Dange, Indrajit, Surendranath, they participated and contributed to the formation of All India Trade Union Congress. The delegates at the Congress, they elected Lala Lachipati Rai as the new president of the All India Trade Union Congress and also as India's representative at the next International Labour Organization meeting. They discussed several resolutions and these included a demand for protection from police interference, maintenance of an unemployment register, restriction on exporting foodstuffs, compensation for injuries and also health insurance. In addition, the delegates demanded that Indian workers should be given reasonable representation in the government, just like the employers who had representatives in the legislative councils. See, up to the year 1945, congressmen, socialists, communists and others, they worked together in the All India Trade Union Congress, which was then the Central Trade Union Organization of Workers of India. However, subsequently, the trade union movement got split on political lines and at present, All India Trade Union Congress owes allegiance to the Communist Party of India. See, the unions affiliated to this Congress are from textile industry, engineering, coal, steel industry, road and transport, electricity board and also including several components of unorganized sector like BD industry, construction, head load workers, Anganwadi, local bodies, handloom and also it includes many agriculture workers unions as well. So AETUC is actively involved in organizing workers and has considerable membership in agriculture manufacture also in service sectors and know that from both private and public sector enterprises. This Congress is affiliated to World Federation of Trade Unions which is a major international trade union having affiliates all over the world. Now let's see the broad aims and objects of this Congress. See, one is to establish a socialist state in India, then to socialize and nationalize the means of production, distribution and exchange as far as possible, then to ameliorate the economic and social conditions of the working class, then to watch, promote, safeguard and further or promote the interests, rights and privileges of workers in all the matters relating to their employment. Now coming to the achievements, they have played a significant role particularly in fixing the working hours, in extending medical insurance, education and accidental insurance to the workers. It also helped women in India into the political and labor forefront. So these are some of the important information with reference to this Congress. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article talks about an important provision in the Code on Wages 2019 that empowers women labor. We'll discuss this provision in this analysis. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. Now we know that Ministry of Labor and Employment had introduced four labor codes to simplify and rationalize the existing central labor laws. One of the four codes is the Code on Wages 2019. The other codes are Code on Social Security and Welfare, Code on Occupational Safety, Health and Working Conditions, then Code on Industrial Relations. Today, let us limit our discussion to few important provisions in terms of gender perspective under the Code on Wages 2019. Now, generally, when we say Code on Wages, this seeks to consolidate and simplify four important legislations. And you can observe the term wages in two legislation. In one legislation, we can find the term bonus. And in another, the term remuneration is found. So the new code consolidates and simplifies these four legislations. The new code is expected to become operational once the government notifies the rules framed for its implementation. Now here, section 26 of the Code on Wages, it deals with eligibility for payment of bonus. 
It says that every employee who has worked for at least 30 days in an accounting year shall be given an annual minimum bonus as determined by appropriate government and the employer. It is calculated at the rate of 8 and 1 third percentage of wages earned by the employee or 100 rupees, whichever is higher. Now this has to be given irrespective of the fact whether the employer has any allocable surplus during the previous accounting year. Now see the section 26 of the code has to be read along with section 29 of the code which deals with disqualification of bonus. Section 29 states that if an employee is dismissed from the service for several reasons, then she or he is disqualified from receiving bonus under the code. Here we have to take note of the grounds of dismissal. It could be fraud or riotous or violent behavior while on the premises of the establishment or theft or misappropriation or sabotage of any property of the establishment and very importantly conviction for sexual harassment. Now know that as per the existing Payment of Bonus Act of 1965, this act mentioned only first three grounds. Now the provision of losing bonus if convicted for sexual harassment is added by the code on wages. This is very important as the prospect of losing one's benefit may make employees more careful of their conduct in workplace and with fellow employees. Now adding this provision is commented as a brilliant nudge to get people to be on their best behavior in the workplace by the experts. So these provisions will act as an additional deterrent apart from the Posh Act of 2013 which is the Sexual Harassment of Women in the Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act of 2013. Now we know that under this act, firms are required to form an internal complaints committee to inquire into complaints. The committee is institutionalized to hear complaints and grievances in relation to incidents of sexual harassment. And this committee has the powers to decide if someone is guilty and it also has powers to report it to the police. Now under section 13 of the Posh Act 2013, where the internal complaints committee arrives at a conclusion that the allegation against an employee has been proved, that is the allegation of sexual harassment against an employee has been proved, then the internal complaints committee shall recommend to the employer to take action for sexual harassment or to deduct salary or wages of the particular employee. Here the term conclusion is used where the internal complaints committee finds that the allegation against the particular person has been proved. Now experts differ with respect to interpreting conviction for sexual harassment given under section 29 of code on wages. So there is lack of clarity because they are asking whether the conviction for sexual harassment includes only the conviction by the courts of law or does it also include the conclusion of internal complaints committee that an allegation of sexual harassment leveled against a particular employee was found true. Expectation is that now that the rules are being framed, the rules will shed some clarity and light into these words conviction for sexual harassment. Now let's see two, three gender related provisions on code on wages and conclude the discussion. Section three of the code prohibits discrimination on the ground of gender. It clearly states that there shall be no discrimination in an establishment among its employees on the ground of gender in matters relating to wages by the same employer and in case of work of a similar nature. The employer while recruiting an employee shall not discriminate on the ground of sex while recruiting for the same work and conditions of employment. But this is not applicable if the employment of women in such work is prohibited or restricted by any law and force. With this we come to the end of analysis of this news article. In this analysis we mainly focused on bonus related provisions particularly the disqualification of bonus for conviction for sexual harassment charges. Now let's move on to analysis of next news article. This news article mentions that the 15th Finance Commission is going to submit its main report in November 2020 after three years it was constituted. In this context know that Finance Commission is a constitutionally mandated body. It is constituted by the President under Article 280 of Indian Constitution. According to Clause 1 of Article 280, if the president considers necessary at the expiration of every fifth year or even at an earlier time, she or he shall constitute a finance commission. 
now it consists of a chairman and four other members they will be appointed by the president now coming to the duties of the finance commission it has to make recommendations to the president with respect to the distribution of the net proceeds of taxes between the union and the states and know that the net proceeds of taxes are to be divided between the union and the states and also it has to make recommendations on the allocation between the states of their respective shares of such proceeds of taxes then it can make recommendation on the principles that should govern the grants in aid of the revenues of the states out of the consolidated fund of india then it makes recommendation on measures needed to augment the consolidated fund of a state to supplement the resources of the panchayats and municipalities in the state on the basis of recommendations made by finance commission of the state and it makes recommendation on any other matter referred by the president in the interest of sound finance now we saw that finance commission will be constituted at the end of 5 years or before so accordingly 15th finance commission was constituted in november 2017 the commission was asked to make recommendations related to the matters mandated under article 280 and other matters referred by president under terms of reference Initially finance commission was asked to make recommendations covering a period of 5 years from financial year 2020-2021 to 2024-25 and to submit report by October 2019 however the submission period was extended and it was decided to submit for the first financial year that is 2020-2021 and then to submit a report for the years from financial year 2022 to financial year 2026 and this report is to be submitted by 30th october 2020 the news is that this report is now going to be submitted in the month of november so finance commission has finalized its report for fund devolution from the center to states for the five years from financial year 2022 to 26 the report also includes some of the key recommendations including the viability of creating a separate defense and national security fund as suggested by the center note that as per article 281 of the constitution the president lays the recommendations of finance commission before both the houses of parliament along with an explanatory memorandum on the action taken on its recommendations we have been seeing the term recommendations so the recommendations are not binding on the government however the recommendations will be given serious consideration and there is a kind of checks and balance type of system as an explanatory memorandum on the action taken on the recommendations of finance commission is also placed before the houses of parliament wherein the government will explain why certain recommendations could not be considered or implemented now let's move on to next part of the discussion This news article talks about Public Affairs Index 2020. See knowledge about important reports or indices which are released by important and well-known organizations will give an upper hand in prelims examination if a question related to reports or indices is asked. Usually going by the trend in last 5 years, one or two questions are asked in this area. Now let's come to this index which is released by the Public Affairs Center. See the Public Affairs Center is a not for profit think tank it is engaged in research focusing on SDG in the context of India it is one of the civil society led institutional initiatives to mobilize demand for good governance in our country it is registered as a society under Karnataka Societies Registration Act of 1960 now coming to this index states are ranked based on governance performance in the context of sustainable development based on this composite public affairs index the governments performance is analyzed under the three pillars of equity growth and sustainability now this is important now coming to the recently released report it states that among the larger states category kerala was adjudged as the best governed state whereas up became the least performer in that category kerala has a pa index of 1.388 whereas up has minus 1.461 and in terms of governance four southern states kerala tamil nadu andhra pradesh and karnataka stood in the first four ranks in the large states category now coming to small states category goa ranked first the least performer in this category was manipur now the report also ranked governance in union territories as well important highlights is given here for your reference with this we move on to the next part of the discussion 
This news article states that the governor of Tamil Nadu grants assent to the horizontal quota bill that provides horizontal quota and UG medical courses to students of government schools who have qualified in need. Yesterday in our analysis, we have discussed in detail about this matter, the delay caused by the governor to decide on assent to bills. We discussed these aspects in our yesterday's analysis. So we request the viewers to watch yesterday's analysis to know about these aspects. Now this news article states that Odisha state government has requested Wildlife Institute of India to conduct a fresh study for identifying the movement of endangered olive ridley sea turtles. Now with reference to olive ridley turtles, we would like to inform that we have discussed this on two days and these subjects were covered on these two analysis. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. See this question with reference to Finance Commission asked in prelims 2011. They are saying with reference to Finance Commission, which of the following statements is correct? It encourages inflow of foreign capital for infrastructure development. It facilitates proper distribution of finances among public sector undertakings. It ensures transparency in financial administration. None of the statements given above is correct in this context. See, the correct answer for this question is option D. Because Finance Commission is not mandated to do any of these functions. It is a recommendation making body. It in itself does not perform these tasks. You carefully observe the statements. It is given as it encourages, it facilitates, it ensures. If referred by President in the interest of sound finance, it may give recommendations to facilitate proper distribution of finances among PSUs. So the correct answer is option D. See this question, two statements are given, they are asking which of the statements given above are correct. It is a non-permanent constitutional body. This statement is correct, non-permanent here refers to the fact that it is constituted with new set of members at the end of five years or before by president. First statement is correct. Second statement, every recommendation made by Finance Commission under the provisions of the constitution has to be laid before each house of parliament by the prime minister. First half is correct, but not by the prime minister, but by the president. Therefore, the second statement is incorrect. Correct answer option A, one only. See this question, which of the following comes under the ambit of definition of sexual harassment as per the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act of 2013? Physical contact and advances, a request for sexual favors, making sexually colored remarks, showing adult pornography, any unwelcome non-verbal conduct of sexual nature. See, as per section 2N of this law, sexual harassment includes all of these. Therefore, the correct answer for this question is option B. Now, you should note that the law defines sexual harassment as including any of these unwelcome acts whether directly or even by implication now this question is with reference to sponge cities which of the following statements is not correct with reference to the concept of sponge cities recently seen in news you may pause the video and go through the options you can find that options B and D are contradicting each other so therefore either one of these two options must be correct and with the help of other two options, A and C, you can arrive at the correct answer or you can arrive at eliminating the incorrect statement. The correct answer is option B. C. Spawn cities play a very important role in reducing the flood risk as such cities offer more permeable spaces for the natural retention and percolation of water. Permeability here refers to the fact that water easily moves underground without resistance. And spawn cities also lower burdens on drainage systems, water treatment plants, artificial channels and also on natural streams. They lower burden on water treatment plant because they offer more clean water to the city as they provide replenished groundwater and also provide greater accessibility to water resources for cities. So the correct answer is option B. Now see this question. The public affairs index ranks Indian states governance performance in the context of sustainable development. It is released by Niti Aayog, Department of Administrative Reform and Public Grievances, Public Affairs Centre, Transparency International India. Correct answer is option C. This question is with reference to Code on Wages 2019. Two statements are given. They are asking which of the above statements are incorrect. First statement, the code will repeal Payment of Bonus Act 1965 and Equal Remuneration Act 1976. 
the statement is correct in addition to these two laws it will also repeal payment of wages act 1936 and minimum wages act of 1948 second statement as per the code an employee dismissed from the service for conviction for sexual harassment is disqualified from receiving annual bonus this statement is also correct other reasons for disqualification from receiving bonus includes fraud riotous behavior or violent behavior on the premises of establishment theft misappropriation or sabotage of any property of establishment correct answer option d neither one nor two are incorrect now this question is with reference to all india trade union congress three statements are given they are asking which of the above statements are correct first statement it was founded in 1920 to represent india at the international labor organization the statement is correct second statement lala lajpati rai was the first president of aitc this is also correct it has membership from both private and public sector enterprises this statement is also correct therefore the correct answer is option d 1 2 and 3 we have given you a practice mains question in gs paper 3 you may write answers and by following these steps you may post it in the comment section with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video click the like button comment share and subscribe to shankarayas academy youtube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation